going to the cloud and we're live hello everybody and welcome to tgi the greatest indoor reading series again as we mentioned before recording not to be confused with that interior design podcast um my name is Ridge Cresswell. For those of you who don't know me, I am a um, human being residing in Queens, New York. Uh, I have done, amongst other things, audiobook narration, a uh, little bit of writing and music and other creative things. And I am also lucky to share my life with Trina Thibodeau over there, the creator of TGI, who uh, about, we actually just had it hit kind of a milestone, which is when I made uh, my own Zoom account for TGI. Um, I pre-scheduled as many as I could, which at the time you can schedule 20. And this is it, this is 20. So I'm gonna have to reschedule some. That means this five months alone under my, you know, Zoom account, we had two weeks on Crowdcast, which were regrettable. And before that we had a couple months as well. So we have actually been doing this since March, um, every week except for one and uh four or five writers uh a week we actually um you know we're thrilled that people continue to recommend people we're thrilled that people continue to come to listen but this is this is a wonderful and honestly one of the most interactive and social parts of my week at least um so thank you uh tonight we have a lineup of four uh readers um across what looks like a variety of material we will see uh, I could be wrong the, on, by some bizarre cosmic chance. They could all read from the same book. I don't know for sure. I'm joking that, that, that joke was too dry. That happens sometimes. Okay. Um, at the end of the show, I can give everyone information about how to stay in touch with us. The easiest way though, is if you're, if you do have to run out beforehand, uh, just go to tgicast.com. It has all the links, relevant information, upcoming events, uh, video archives of past events, all this stuff. Um, that's over there. So thank you, Trina. Just posted it in the chat, tgicast.com. So without any further, people who've been viewing the show for a long time know that I say to, I say without further ado too much. So I'm going to say without further, I like foo for all, foo for all. Our first reader tonight is R.L. Mazes. She is the author of Other People's Pets and the short story collection, We Love Anderson Cooper, both from Celadon Books, Macmillan. Her stories have aired on national public radio and have appeared in Electric Literature's recommended reading. Her essays have been published in the, excuse me, in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and have aired on NPR. Mazes was born and raised in Queens, New York, and lives in Boulder County, Colorado, with her husband, Steve, and her muses, Ari, a cat who was dropped in the animal shelter's night box like an overdue library book, and Rosie, a dog who spent fir her first year homeless in South Dakota and thinks Colorado is downright balmy. Sounds like an excellent home for these two pets. So RL, you can take it away. You should be able to unmute yourself. Oh, I, of course. Hold on. I think I muted you immediately as you unmuted yourself because of course I did. Now you should be good. We're good, yeah. Okay, thanks. So, um, I am going to read from the beginning of Other People's Pets. I wanna back up a sec. I wanna thank TGI um, for having me and uh, Noli for recruiting me and um, just really super excited to be at an event that's out of Queens where I'm from. So um, I'm gonna read from Other People's Pets and I'm going to read the prologue and a little bit of the first chapter. The only, um, the only thing I'll say about the book is that the book is, for the most part, about the adult main character, Lala, although the prologue takes place when she's a child and the first chapter will pick it up when she's an adult. Prologue, winter, 1999. One minute. Lala joins a flock of geese, skating across the lake as they fly overhead, and the next, squeak crack, she plunges into darkness. Her snowsuit inhales icy water and clings to her, weighing her down and threatening to pull her under. Though she tries to tread water, her skates are too heavy. She opens her mouth to scream, and the lake rushes down her throat. Just when she thinks she'll drown, she sees her mother, Mama, she gurgles, but the woman who calls herself mother turns and skates away. 
Frigid black water tugs at Lala's ankles, pours concrete into her muscles. She goes under. Still and cold, it's the loneliest place she's ever been. Too dark to see anything that might thrive there. Perfectly silent until the sharp bark of a dog cuts through the water, summoning her back. Maybe help has arrived. Remembering swim lessons her father gave her, Lala gathers her strength and frog kicks to the surface. 10 feet away, a black dog awaits her. She swims toward him, reaching the edge of the hole in the ice. Hands on the white mass, she pushes as hard as she can, but can't raise herself. She frog kicks again, desperate to stay above water. The dog howls. Urged on by the animal and no longer alone, she presses her arms against the surface of the ice, but lacks the strength to lift herself out. Exhausted, the cold stiffening her muscles, she waits to sink again. But this time, she doesn't go under. The arms of her jacket have frozen to the ice. That's all she remembers. Later, she learns, a man and woman arrive to skate. They found the dog keeping watch, Lala unconscious, attached to the ice. On her cell phone, the woman called emergency services who rescued Lala. The dog bounded into the woods before anyone could reward him. No one knew whose dog he was or where he had come from. It wasn't until Lala was being loaded into an ambulance that her mother returned. She had gone to get help, she said. From under warm covers the next morning, Lala hears a dove cuckoo to its mate. The bird's heart thrums with excitement. When her own pulse takes up the beat, Lala doesn't know what to make of it. Chapter one, fall, 2015. In exam room four, Lala rubs the silky muzzle of a Labrador retriever named Duck. A woman who looks to be in her thirties pales as she points out a lump on the Labrador's side, but focusing on the dog, Lala barely notices the owner's anxiety. She takes a history and performs an exam. Soft and movable, the growth is probably a harmless lipoma. What do you think, the woman says. Lala knows better than to offer a diagnosis before the resident has seen the patient. I'll get the doctor, she says. With a 22 gauge hypodermic needle, Dr. Munn extracts cells from the lump. Though nowhere near the tip, Lala feels the prick as it goes in. The doctor shows her the cells under a microscope, then gives the owner the good news. It's a benign fatty tumor, just as Lala suspected. Pleased to give the dog a reprieve, Lala remembers why she loves her work, even the general practice rotation, which others find dull. Her exhaustion from working 12-hour days fades. Color returns to the owner's face. I don't know how to thank you both, she says. We're glad to help, Dr. Munn says. When Lala is silent, the doctor clears her throat. She turns to Lala expectantly. Glad to help, Lala parrots, already thinking about her next patient. An hour later, Lala prepares to place an IV in a border collie's cephalic vein. The dog must have eaten peanut butter biscuits in the waiting room. They make Lala's tongue feel sticky and thick. She shaves a spot on the dog's front leg and scrubs the site with alcohol and chlorhexidine before inserting the needle. She can hardly believe in less than a year she'll be graduating and seeing patients of her own. When the phone in her pocket goes off, it isn't the ringtone for her fiance, Clem, doctor, doctor, give me the news, or her father, Zev, run, daddy, run. So she puts it out of her mind. Treating a nervous aging poodle, Lala scratches above the dog's heart and feels a pleasurable ache in her own chest. You're a champ, Gordy, she says, after drawing his blood. But the dog doesn't look at her or otherwise seem to hear. She walks the poodle to the waiting room where a man in a navy suit reaches for the leash. He never greets me at the door anymore, he says, his voice quavering. He's not a butler, Lala mutters. Excuse me, the man says. Could be his hearing, he is an older dog, Lala says. In the break room, a tofu and avocado sandwich in one hand, Lala finally taps the phone message. Hearing John O'Bannon's voice, she stops chewing. O'Bannon is an attorney who represented Zev and Lala in a burglary case when she was a teenager. Sorry to tell you this, he says. Your dad was arrested. Bail hearing is tomorrow at 10. Why don't you stop by this afternoon? I'm still at 329 Carson, second floor. 
Lala's throat tightens around a lump of bread. She taps the message again. At the word arrested, she squeezes the sandwich, her fingers punching through the whole grain bread. Zev can't go to prison. He's the only parent she has left. She can't afford to lose him. The sandwich falls apart, avocado streaking the industrial tabletop. Gathering the pieces, she stumbles to the trash and drops them in. She emails Dr. Munn that a family emergency has come up and she'll be out that afternoon. She would tell the resident in person, but doesn't trust herself to speak. They're charging him with burglary, O'Bannon says. The lawyer has aged. His cheeks sag. The pores on his nose are big enough to house a fly. I'll need a $10,000 retainer, but it's gonna cost a lot more than that before it's over. Sloppy piles of official looking papers rise on his desktop. Crime is as popular as ever. Lala's knee bounces. She wishes O'Bannon brought a dog to work, the kind to lay its muzzle in your lap. What did Zev say he could give you, she says. When he heard the DA was asking to set bail at $50,000 because a victim was in the hospital, Zev said he'd have to rely on a public defender. He can barely scrape together the $7,500 fee for the bail bondsman, the lawyer says. Lala isn't surprised. What little extra money Zev had, he gave her to help with veterinary school. Though she can't afford to pay O'Bannon either, she hates to turn the case over to a public defender. As a teenager, she watched them in the courtroom while she waited for her own burglary case to be called. They leaf through client files as though they'd never, never seen them before. She would ask Clem for the money, but he disapproves of Zev's occupation. And besides, what he earns as a chiropractor barely covers their bills. There was a time she would have raised the money herself, breaking into the homes of the wealthy. Some people have more than they need, more than anyone should. But she promised Clem she was finished with that. Lala thinks briefly of her mother. She has no idea where Alyssa is or if she'd be willing to help. Give us a few days to figure something out, she says. The lawyer drums his fingers on his lips. I suppose that would be okay, he says. As Lala gets up to leave, she sees on O'Bannon's desk a studio photograph of a harried woman and three robust boys. It's a different family than the one he used to have. Round two, she presumes. Or maybe the boys are his stepchildren, cared for by a host of mothers and fathers. Growing up, Lala had only Zev. Her mother disappeared when Lala was eight. Four years later, Lala buried a pair of white cotton underwear at the bottom of a hamper because a constellation of mysterious brown stains convinced her she had had an accident. Discovering the panties, Zev said, you're a woman now, no need to be ashamed. Though it was 10 at night, he drove to a supermarket and bought sanitary pads. Returning home, he bleached the underwear. The next day, Zev arranged fruit, two lemons, an avocado, and loose purple grapes on a table and demonstrated how a woman's reproductive system worked. Pretty clever design, he said. He told Lala it was one of the few things his mother had taught him in case he had a daughter. After Zev walked Lala through two monthly cycles, they ate the grapes and Zev made guacamole. If you have cramps, we can warm up a hot water bottle, he said, while he mixed the garlic and avocado. Lala scooped a dollop of guacamole onto a chip and opened her mouth. Delicious uterus, she said, after she swallowed. Gourmet, Zev said. All right, thank you so much. That was, that was excellent. That's such a um, immediately engaging beginning to, to a story. Um, you know, obviously, someone falling through the ice is like one of the most dramatic things you could put in something but there's something um there was something in there immediately about um the way uh she described in or the way the thoughts were described at least as her mother said she was going to get help and like it's almost like this there's no guarantee she was so it's like the mother is immediately the sort of abandoning distrustful figure so when you jump forward to her being so fixated on animals it's almost like i got the entire picture of her you know she she isn't someone who relates to or trusts humans quite the same way that she does animals um which i think is something a lot of people uh especially maybe who grow up with some degree of social awkwardness identify with actually anyone who grows up with pets identifies with because pets are like actually capable of unconditional love unlike Hi. people to some extent well you know um but I think that's that's fascinating and then i you know noli was telling us a bit about the book we were talking um after the show 
uh, last week and um, just just like the premise but just this execution so far I'm I, I want to know more you know what I mean that's all I can say I mean it's it's really uh, so interesting um, Yay. <laughs> yeah just a, like a family of chiropractor veterinarian criminals who <laughs> <laughs> you've sold me already so uh this is Thank this you. is other, this is other people's pets it's available now yes so people yeah, it came out you... july 14 height of the pandemic and oh. uh, and uh it's available uh, pretty much everywhere books are sold awesome well uh, i'm sorry that your your launch was mid-pandemic but obviously uh We've talked to a few writers who've had that problem. Was it, what, did you have any events scheduled or was it sort of the launch was far enough out after you started to see things go weird that you were able to make alternative arrangements? Um, I had a bunch of uh, events scheduled and everything had to change. And some events went virtual, which was terrific. Mm -hmm. And some got canceled and then all kinds of new ones popped up. So, it, you know, I mean, I don't think there's anything like being in a bookstore with people mm -hmm have a lot there's just something very wonderful about joining but i will say the zoom events have been incredible i mean they've just been incredible the fact that i could be meeting with all of you and you're in queens and i'm here and i had one that was out of israel and mm -hmm. this one from canada i mean just they're they're so global that um it's really um it's really a pleasure to do them and um, and it gives writers an opportunity and readers an opportunity to meet, you know, it's so weird. This whole thing has grown up and I hope a lot of it continues mm -hmm. even after we can all go to bookstores again, because it's just this wonderful opportunity to meet with people you would not otherwise get to meet and hear re writers you wouldn't otherwise get to hear. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, you know, uh, selfishly from my own perspective as the host of this thing, you know, I get to see four or five writers every week and also get to ask them a question if I want to based on what they've written. And I think, you know, by the way, anyone who's in here just spectating, we will hang around after the show ends officially. And if you want to ask questions or if you want to, you know, reach out to people, you should do so. I think, I think you're, you're exactly right. And by the way, we have talked about it and we are planning on continuing this uh, even when things go back to whatever normal looks like whenever that happens. We just might move it from Friday to a different day if people can go out again. But <laughs> anyway yeah. once Mark. again thank you thank you so much and uh so wonderful to hear your work thank you thank you all right we are off to a uh roaring start here our next reader is kimberly dark she is a writer professor and raconteur working to reveal the hidden architecture of everyday life so that we can reclaim our power as social creators she's the author of fat pretty and soon to be old the Daddies, and Love and Errors, and her essays, stories, and poetry are widely published in academic and popular online publications alike. Her ability to make the personal political is grounded in her training as a sociologist, and you can find her course offerings in sociology at Cal State San Marcos and writing arts at Cal State Summer Arts. So, Kimberly, you should be able to unmute and take us away. Hey, thanks so much for having me. And thank you, Noli, for uh, inviting me. And um, yeah, I'm going to read you a uh, part of an essay from this book, the Fat, Pretty, and Soon to Be Old book. And um, there are indeed essays about uh, aging and beauty here, but, um, but I'm going with fat tonight. And um, uh, yeah. Here we go. These are these are essays, of course. I mean, it's an essay collection, but uh, they're also, uh, you know, sort of arranged in such a way that, that it also might be a memoir. You know, it would depend on your disposition when you were reading. This is called Anatomy of a Put Down. Recently at dinner, my neighbor's five-year-old grandson Taylor watched me sit down and said to his grandpa at full volume. <laughs> she's even fatter than me. She's fat. He finished with emphasis, looking at me out of the corner of his eye, because clearly those statements were meant for me too. Grandfather, along with two others at the dinner table, did that pull back, that suck up all the air and say nothing that people do in awkward social moments. Now, I know this child, not well, but I've had meals with him before. I've seen him in the neighborhood. He has never called me fat before, but who knows? Maybe he was bored and looking for a bit of entertainment. He seemed to want to amuse himself with adult discomfort, or maybe just with my shame. 
though he was talking to his grandfather, trying to find an accomplice in the joke, I said, hey, Taylor, did you just call me fat? And he turned to me with a little bit of fear on his face because, whoa, this is not how it is supposed to go. I was also speaking at full volume for all of the diners to hear. You know what? I don't think there's anything wrong with being called fat because I don't think there's anything wrong with being fat. But some people think of that as an insult world. So maybe you shouldn't go around calling people fat until they call themselves fat. And then you know it's OK, because otherwise you could really hurt somebody's feelings. You're not hurting my feelings, though. Fat is just one of the ways bodies can be. So what? His mouth hung open a bit, staring at me. One of the other diners, relieved, said, wow, that was a really good answer. I nodded, and then speaking to her, but also so that young Taylor could hear, I said, well, you know, some people have learned that being fat is shameful. That's why everybody goes silent when a kid says something like that. It's good to show them that there's no shame needed. Now, Grandfather raised his eyebrows impressed and then turned to Taylor and said a bit tauntingly, Ha ha! She got no shame for you! Taylor's mouth still hung open. You want to know what shame is? That's when you get caught stealing something at the store and everybody sees. That's when you feel shame. I'm not sure what Taylor was absorbing at that point, but he might have just been thinking, wow, sometimes you pipe up and everything takes a hard right turn. That's for sure, kid. That's for sure. See, kids learn from reflection and trial and error just like adults, and there is sure no fast track. A little while later, he called his grandfather old man in a pointed tone meant to hurt. I gave him the I see you eyes, but I didn't say anything. Taylor was five as we shared that meal, and I know him to be very smart and fidgety and forever mouthy at the dinner table. My grandson and Taylor are the same age, though my first reflex might have been to feel smug for how much better behaved my grandson is than Taylor and how his parents definitely taught him not to feel or throw body shame. It's not like he's perfect. He could also poke a friend and say of someone else sitting at the same table, <laughs> he's fat or stupid or has stinky feet or eats salt for dinner or, 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 or. Of course he could. Everybody learns that it's possible to elevate oneself by putting someone else down. And if he learns that other people will collude with put downs and that he can feel a sense of belonging by creating an inside joke about somebody else, it's not just possible he'll do that. It's likely. Furthermore, he could do that at school and never admit to being that kind of person when he's at home with his parents who don't approve of body shaming. Now, when my son was five, I overheard him with some neighborhood friends as they played a game on our patio. They were talking about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It was the biggest show on TV at the time. They were reminiscing about their favorite episodes, and my son chimed in with his favorite episode, too, blow by blow. One thing puzzled me, though. We didn't have a TV. I asked him later where he had seen that show, and he shrugged and said he'd never seen it. When I told him what I overheard, he looked at me, sweet-faced as ever, and said, oh, when I heard kids talking about the show, I memorized what they said so that the next time kids were talking about the show, I could talk about it too. Everybody talks about it. I wanna talk about it. I nodded because, you know, that made sense. See, the woman seated next to me at the dinner table, when Taylor commented on me being fat, one of the people who recoiled in silent horror when he said it, she's a kindergarten teacher. And she's also one of the people who said I gave a really good answer. She said that she has seen children in her class say this sort of thing, trying to make other people feel bad. And she said she never knew what to say. And I thought, Really? I mean, even though a person has children, 
or works with children, somehow we may not find an adequate response. And I think that means we aren't really looking. Kids learn that there is power in befuddling adults, just like there's power to be gained in successfully hurting another person's feelings. It's a sad kind of power, but it is power nonetheless. Taylor was definitely puffed up in that small moment when everyone fell uncomfortably silent before I spoke. Now, I'm also thinking of the particular wording in Taylor's comment. She's even fatter than me. Now, he is not a fat child at all, though I have seen him put away some dessert for brownies that very night. So I imagine people have threatened him with becoming fat. Quit eating those or you'll get fat. That's the sort of thing people say to kids all the time. Still, this is a sophisticated game Taylor has already learned to play well before his sixth birthday. Not only is he controlling adult behavior, albeit briefly, and not only is he bonding with someone over the put down of another, and not only does he know which things to say to shame a grown woman, he knows how to improve his own image in the process. While most adults put aside direct put downs for subtler shade, many adults still think that if they put themselves down too, they're not really being big meanies to include others in the insult. It's one of the ways that fat people themselves can perpetuate fat hatred at the same time as seeking community. Come on, that kind of insult says, we're all big and gross. I'll admit it before you throw it in my face and I'll pull you in while I'm at it. A Taylor's a smart kid. I'll bet you know some like him. You know, one of the best things about parenting and grandparenting is the constant opportunity to up our own game. And we get to decide which game it is and what we're teaching. Whenever there is a silence after an insult like Taylor's or about any unspoken bias, like when a kid innocently comments on someone's race or social class, we can pay attention, make a mental note, and then talk that stuff through with peers so that we invent the answer that teaches something positive the next time. I mean, we rarely have the perfect comeback when we're surprised, but why be surprised by things that are said or intimated again and again? I am certainly not surprised when someone speaks ill of fat. It happens all the time. Taylor's comment, at least, was clear and direct. See, that's all I did when I spoke up. I had invented a better answer and I delivered it with clear, calm eye contact. Everyone at the table felt better and hopefully, hopefully Taylor learned something. At the very least, he added a new response to the possible repertoire of answers that adults can give. See, beginning in childhood, I was handed the same shame that every fat person has been handed. And for the first part of my life, I carried it. And then I learned to put it down. And then I learned to talk about it. You can too. If we want kids to grow up and take responsibility for their words and their actions, then it's time adults do more than ourselves. So that comes from Fat, Pretty, and Soon to Be Old, which came out in, thank you, the end of um, 2019. So it was out a little while before anything got shut down. And um, uh, and oh, and I want to just say that uh, right now the publisher, AK Press, has it on sale for fifty percent off for the ebook. So that's nice. Um, that's thank awesome. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much, Kimberly. That was amazing. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, both in content and delivery. Uh, you know, I I I really appreciate like. Um, it, it it changed something about the quality of it uh, that you were sort of making. Uh, uh, you know, proverbial eye contact, camera contact. Um, but also 
you know, I can hear the sociology in there to some extent, but I can also hear a, a really um, sort of empathetic analysis of how children learn social power. And, you know, I had never thought of it before because obviously, you know, the first inclination, if, um, I don't know, in my family, at least, if, if a child was to say something maybe potentially offensive, embarrassing, insulting, whatever, the first inclination would always be like, no, 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 don't say that. Don't say that. Don't say that. Don't do that. And what that does is it tells the child like, ooh, there's something there. You know, there's something I could use. Because, <laughs> you know, I know in, in my own life as, a, as an insecure child, the ability to offend people was power in a way. And, and I think this sort of idea of coming up with a different, better answer that not only um, responds without aggression in a way, uh, you know, in a direct way, an assertive way, not an aggressive way, but also um, educates or points out the, the problem with the belief that that person's expressing. Like, this is such a incredible necessary idea for so many problems in society and the, the number one thing that i left that with honestly was exactly how you ended it with if we expect children to grow up and exercise you know good judgment shouldn't we do it ourselves is like i just personally grew up with this understanding that um adults are hypocrites they just are and i always heard things like you know life isn't fair and there's there's going to be assholes everywhere you go and all and all these sort of things it's like but then but then why teach me to try to teach me to be such a good person too it doesn't make any sense so i really love this idea of like rethinking this um i mean clearly you've put obviously a lot of work into thinking about this <laughs> um, i don't know if i have a question so much as just uh Actually, people are asking in the chat. So this is an interesting question. Have you have you done an audiobook of this? I have not done an audiobook of this. Um, the 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 publisher uh, the publisher needed to decide within a year to do one themselves, mm -hmm. and so I do actually just now have the the option to do that. Um, and I might, I, I recorded an audiobook of um, my other book, The Daddies. Mm. And wow, that was an education, you know, do, doing, uh, uh, because I have been doing storytelling on stage for many years, but not, that's a different thing, you know? Yeah. And um, so, so I may still, thank you for. Yeah, that. no, I mean, I mean, just basically people's reactions to your reading of your own work. I mean, I really think, um, because you understand that inside and out, but you also are clearly like a skilled communicator of it because it did not come across as, let me explain to you the actual, like, you know, the mechanics of an insult, but that's what it was. So I, I would, I would, I would love to listen to it and I would love to read the rest of your book. So but thank you so much for coming and sharing. You're so welcome. All right. We are, we're, you know, I've never um, in, in the history of the show uh, hit anybody where I've been like, we haven't had a dud. That's what I'm trying to say. But I was gonna, I was gonna say we're batting a thousand, but it's like we're kind of always like I don't, I've never had someone where I'm like I don't really get that. But um, that's testament to the uh, social network that has been built here um, in terms of recommendations and and readers because everybody's doing great. That was really uh, underwhelming and uh, inarticulate. At any rate, our next reader is Jen Koretnik. She is a Miami-based poet, food critic, lifestyle journalist, and author or co-author of 20 books, including four cookbooks, four guidebooks, and 10 volumes of poetry. Her latest full-length book is The Burning Where Breath Used to Be, David Robert Books 2020. Her poem, Poems appear widely in publications including Barrow Street, Michigan Quarterly Review, The Missouri Review, Terrain, and Under a Warm Green Linden, and her articles, satire, and essays in The Atlantic.com, Guernica, McSweeney's, NPR, and Shondaland. She also co-writes the Distillery newsletter with her sister, Betsy Koretnik. The winner, she is also the winner of the 2020 Tiferet Writing Award for Poetry, and is a 2019 and 20 to 2020 Deering Estate Artist in Residence. Jen, you should be able to unmute and take us away. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the introduction of not having a dud yet, because now I feel <laughs> just, just a little bit of pressure. Um, 
<clears throat> but no, I really, I really do appreciate um, Noli and and you, Rich and and Trina. Thank you for having me. And I see a few familiar faces in the audience. And of course, Marissa, I always um, appreciate you shouting me out. Um, but mostly, I'm so happy to see my mom and dad um, that I haven't seen in so long. So I was I was not going to start with a poem from my childhood, but there are several poems from my childhood in this book. And I know they've heard this one before um, because it's about my mischievous brother, um, but it's always a fun one to start with because it does um, talk to one of the themes in the book, which is um, literally about taking your breath away in many different ways. How the past four years have sort of um, conspired to take our breath away in several fashions. Um, but in this case, um, it literally was because he was quite an adventurous kid and he made my sister and I do some things that we probably wouldn't have done otherwise. So this is called Plexi Plexiglass Suburbia. In the summertime, when the New Jersey humidity is so thick, it can be kneaded like dough. And there isn't much to do besides taunt and be taunted. Everything depends on making the daredevil club. Admittance is granted upon a feat of such physical audacity that even a Spartan, even a boy like my brother, cannot deny the legacy of red stippled scars it will surely leave behind. The wheelbarrow of flesh and courage that can be carted away in equal glazed measures from the site. My turn at the top of North Ashby with the neon orange skateboard no one knows how to ride, in rain that has been falling for days, collecting in the potholes, the water rubicund with clay from half-built housing developments beside our cul-de-sac. In my imagination, I crouch and glide, but in the end, I sit knees to chest and cast off an unguided blur of white. It's no use. I arrive clean and whole to be cast down with chickens. And I should have said before then that that was actually um, a golden shovel. So all of the end words are the poem from William Carlos Williams, the chicken poem, Red Wheelbarrow. Um, I'm gonna move on to a poem for my husband who's also here, but he's just a blank space. He's gonna sit outside and take my spot outside where all the patio furniture is piled up from the storm. So if I freeze, by the way, just pretend that you hear everything I say. The first line of the poem is also the title, so I'm just going to go right into that. My husband shoots me with Botox 31 times in my forehead, the shallow dish of my temples, the nape of my neck, where as a younger man, he touched his tongue, a fencer's foil. He does not hold the syringe like a love letter or wield it like an apology. Although he says a quiet, I'm sorry. Every time he needs the cartridge, fat, a loosely guarded prisoner has long since escaped my face. Muscles pulled tight from migraine after migraine. I follow his directions to look up, down, wrinkle my forehead like a chow, so that he can measure where the nerves are, avoid making my eyelids droop more than they already do. He assures me the puncture lines will fade. The medicine diffuse, block the transfer of pain lengthen the staccato of light. Three decades ago, he practiced tapping my joints as if they were ice with a rubber hammer, thumped my ribs, dug under bone for my organs and lymph nodes. Now I reap expertise, fanned by his trajectory as he wasps around me. And I wait still within this vortex to be stung and stung and stung. So you don't really marry a doctor, you marry a medical student and you get practiced on 
just in case you wanted to know. If you want to know anything about COVID, you can ask me that too, because now I'm writing about that. That's fun. This is a poem I haven't read from the book yet. Um, it was a lot more fun writing this poem before COVID and we were all stuck in our houses, but it has a lot of social media um, things in it and a lot of pop culture stuff in it. It's called How to Get Away with Slinging a Celine, which is a kind of really expensive purse that also weighs more than three pounds without putting anything in it. Start with the wealth of Zotman curls, which you thought were an influencer's hairstyle until your trainer said they're the necessary bicep prep in order to pronate or supinate like a defense mechanism, the double handles of the medium phantom tote that weighs as much as an emotional support chihuahua. It's true that a Celine is a barbell to flex even before you put in the pooch to take to Whole Foods where you spend the equivalent of your last psych wellness visit on acai bowls and vegan cheeses infused with remote air dried ingredients that influx nostrils with whiffs worse than those from unexpressed anal glands. The trick is to maintain form, even when reaching for champagne grapes, as easily bruised as a mother-in-law's feelings, with a redundant baby calfskin that's the size of your own drummed torso. After all, it is called luggage and could likely stop, well, not a bullet. In your world, there's one kind of bullet and it makes smoothies like true green lawns. And FTW, it would only get in the way of a serrated blade should there be an incident near your two top at that Salt Bay place, where of course you're friends with the chef who flicks grains from his fingers like mummified findings excavated from the pyramid of his nose. But be sure you Instagram it in slow-mo anyway. Seriously, you might just have a chance throwing the phantom at such a marauder of ribs, the way Annalise Keating lobs hers on the table in her lecture hall, as if it's a plate meant to break, but instead skips like a stone on the leathery vest of a weed choked pond. The wingspan alone could shoot to uke a whole quiver of la jol. With one swipe, ricochet them back to your own open floor plan kitchen for hand washing by the housekeeper or into the corks of the screaming eagle you're on the elite access mailing list for and that you store in the cellar under the original Oliver Gal in the consistent set chill that marks your average every day. That's just a little bit about what it like, it's like to live in Miami. Um, I'm gonna read three more poems. These are from my, two are from my next book, um, that's forthcoming from Salmon Poetry. And one is from my quarantine project because everybody has a quarantine project. So my quarantine project is writing an abyss. I like to chat, but I'm gonna start with that. This one is the D poem, it's called Decoys. And I will tell you that I saw three raccoons running around the front of my lawn yet today. So you can imagine what they are doing to the rest of the neighborhood, but actually you'll hear it in the poem. Decoys. Add a bobbing crocodile head to the pool, built from resin and venom. And it's checkmate to the family of raccoons who dab their paws in the shallow ends every night, washing off their meal and leave feces in the chlorinated wake. Gardens a jaundice-eyed owl turns away insistent seed predators, fruit sneaks, and fence jumpers, whether sinister or simply hungry, keeping them circling in hunter-gatherer limbo. But at the marsh with shotguns, make sure to launch the plastic ducks in natural patterns that live birds will fall for, or ripple a pancake slick pond with a pull string no trick is too un-American or quaint to deploy. Headless feeders 
resters, duck butts, spread them on the surface with an eye toward the sky, traffic that memorizes its flyways, underneath being just as important as the visibility ahead. Foreign geese floaters will land some too, as ducks lack our xenophobia and other artificial boundaries yet to be established. Their fate to be both zeppelins and the bombs they carry in their bellies. Thank you. I love seeing the hands, it's so fun. Um, this one is called, I Praise My Neighbors. And we moved about two months before the pandemic started. Um, my office is right at the front of the house. And it's like a parade of dogs where they all go to the bathroom on my lawn. I praise my neighbors who allow their engineered labradoodles and French bulldogs to urinate on the no pee signs staked into the balding pate of my front lawn. The citric liquid searing what's left of the grass day after day, who extend the leashes as far as the historic brick walkway, clipped off like bangs halfway into the yard. I want to be as brave as they are, watching their dogs' legs arabesque over the cast iron silently, castigating them in front of the crate myrtle draped with the ironed hippie hair of Spanish moss and the weeping crimson bottle brush knotted by air plants, ribboned with hummingbirds. I applaud their collective gaze as impassive to criticism as a referee, how it pays no attention to me sitting less than 20 feet away in the window of the Tudor house that once belonged to the Capone family, where the attic is haunted by auburn and emerald iguanas jetaying from the top of the overgrown live oak. And I hide my jewelry, what little of it is left, my grandmother's opal rings stolen when I lived on South Beach, behind the false wall that once shielded shotguns. This courage, it is an unearned misplaced brilliance. It is an ostentation of peafowl bobbing down the middle of my suburban street, indifferent to the engines imploring them to move, matching every car horn with a war cry of their own. As mystified, perhaps, as all of us, the reason they are here, but certain of their right to stay. It is the sound I need to sample, to rebroadcast in continuous four-bar loops, rather than the jeweled good morning voice, the I don't like to make trouble when I'm new here voice, the I clean up my mess by myself voice, instead of letting polished symbols speak this message for me. So I do live in a bird sanctuary where we do have an ostentation of peacocks. And if I were outside, you may be able to hear them. But like all poems, I'm gonna end with a semi true story. This is called During Quarantine. I on Twitter. So an account that is actually called death. So I think I froze just then. So I'm just going to say it one more time. Is that true? Did I just freeze? Okay. So I'll say it one more time. Um, there is an account on Twitter called death at death. And one day I found out that it was following me. So I decided to read all of its tweets. And this poem is called During Quarantine, I Discover That Death Follows Me on Twitter. Death tweets a lot. Death is also from England, by the way. Death tells me our relationship is complicated and wants to simplify things. Death tells me about soul midwives and death doulas, flashlight armed ushers to that final throne. Death tells me to decide now between a 12 piece jazz band and rushes 21 and 12 for my service. Death tells me that wearing a Fitbit may help me die better. 10,000 steps toward a daily end. Death tells me on the day that Wimbledon was supposed to begin, the history behind the sudden death tiebreak. There used to be a lingering death tiebreak, but that was put to death. 
Death tells me the florist's known for reliability and fair pricing. Death does not know the scent of flowers aches my temples, throbs my veins. Death tells me the statistics on selfies, officially five times more fatal than shark attacks. Death tells me jokes, like the one about the man who invented autocorrect dying. Restaurant in peace, death says. Death tells me after the US women win their fourth World Cup, that captains of losing teams were traditionally sacrificed. Death wants to know if I will put down my surviving pets when I die. Death is feeling ancient Egyptian, but walks like a cop in a donut shop. Death wants me to take one last rum safari in Jamaica. Death tells me that dying on holiday does happen, presumably by selfie. Death does not know that vacations have also died. Death tells me lines from obituaries such as, Frida sledgehammered every rule of healthy eating to obtain a nice long life. Death tells me about direct cremation, how I can be turned into ash without a priest. Death does not know that I'm Jewish. Death tells me stories like the one about the golden retriever trained to bring tissues to mourners at a funeral home. Death asks me if I've seen Michael Jackson around. Death is not old enough to ask about Elvis. Death posts links for alternative purses. My coffin can be carried by a Harley Davidson sidecar, Volkswagen camper van, horse-drawn carriage, fire engine, vintage truck, or a bicycle. Death tells me grief will compound chronic pain, speed up an illness. Death tells me I can be unburied in a coffin made of willow or bamboo that biodegrades my, so that my bones will be available to earth. My reception embraceable as limbs. Death does not know that I live at sea level where mangoes snarl the sand. Death tells me how I do and do not feel twice per day, sometimes three times. Death tells me to be hashtag death positive, but so often the numbers say otherwise. Thank you so much. I appreciate you listening. And it was such a pleasure to be here. Oh, thank you so much, Jen. That was, that was a, such a, a wonderful spectrum of like topics and styles. Um, you know, all clearly your voice, but I really appreciated hearing, uh, you know, uh, a variety, uh, I guess, is, is the way to, uh, yeah, range would be the way to say it. Um, I, was, I usually try just to give some form of surprise. You know, the, the thing that would not leave my head was about death and selfies and vacations. <laughs> because Trina and I went to the Grand Canyon last year, and the weekend before we were there, someone backed off the edge while taking a selfie. I think that just happened again recently. Apparently it happens fairly frequently. So maybe this, this death, I'm an assumed person, maybe it's an actual, maybe it's the Grim Reaper sitting there typing, but you know, people need to know these things. I also think um, just engaging with some of these ideas, like you, it struck me that, that going through your work was a bit of um, uh, things that maybe are, towards the edges of human experience like the, the line for example with decoys the line between sort of man-made and nature or uh with neighbors the actual property lines or you know um death right and i just i really appreciated that because those are the places those are the experiences even if you start from um as relatively a mundane image as like french bulldogs ruining your lawn with their pee you get to really interesting places you know what I mean? And I'm not downplaying that. I mean that legitimately. Like if you just, it, it shows me that if you take a moment in your day, something that maybe bothers you or makes you, gives you a reaction and you think it through, you know, as you did in that poem, you really get some sort of meat of life out of it. So I think that's, that's really wonderful. And it also helps that, you know, there are these sort of larger issues about do I belong here? How do I interact with new people? The neighbor issue, it, it helps to view some of those with a bit of humor as well. So I think that balance is really, like was really well struck, I guess is all I would say. So thank you so much. Uh, thank I mean, you, I appreciate it.
Sure. And uh, all right. We have one additional reader tonight. Our final reader tonight is Susan E. Casey. She is an author, a licensed mental health clinician, a certified bereavement group facilitator, and a certified life coach. Throughout the past 25 years, Susan has worked in hospice, inpatient, and home-based settings with teens and adults and taught numerous courses to ex executive leaders and clinicians. Susan's blog on her website, susancasey.com, sorry, susanecasey.com, chronicles her grieving process following the death of her younger brother. As for her fiction, it has won numerous awards, including first place in the Penn Knob Hill Literary Contest and Green Writers National Literary Contest. Rock On, Mining for Joy in the Deep River of Grief is her first work of nonfiction, published February 14th, 2020 by Library Tales Publishing, Ooh, Valentine's Day. Uh, Susan lives in Maine with her husband, Steve, and their golden retriever, Indy. Susan, you should be able to unmute it and uh, close us out here. Okay, great. Can everybody hear me? I'd really like to thank you so much for having me. My friend Gina is here, another one of my writing buddies. And um, I think she found out from Noli, I think it was on Binders. And um, and so Noli, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. Uh, it's a hard act to follow. You guys are amazing. So I am so happy to be uh, a part of this. Um, so yeah, it's my book, Rock On. Um, and it's mine for joy, the deep river of sibling grief. So I interviewed uh, siblings all over the world. Um, and so this is sort of, it's with part memoir and then I weave in their stories and my narration. And so I wasn't really sure what to read tonight. So I'm just gonna read the first few pages of chapter one. Um, it's just snippets, vignettes of showing my, my bond with my brother. The chapter is called Secret Keepers. On a sub-zero winter night when I was 16 years old, I snuck out of my bedroom window, climbed onto the garage roof, hung from the gutter, and jumped onto the picnic table piled high with snow. I scrambled over snow banks to meet my girlfriend who waited for me, headlights turned off at the end of my street. I slid into the passenger side, blew warm breaths into numb hands, and said, I hope we don't get caught, as we zipped away like two delinquents to a party 45 minutes away. Several hours later, with Budweiser on my breath, I climbed back into the garage roof and tucked fingers under the base of my bedroom win window to shimmy it open. It was frozen shut. I am so screwed, was the only thought that came to mind at 1 a.m. Was the kiss from the cute boy I had a crush on for months worth it? It would depend on how badly the night would end. My teeth chattered as I exhaled white puffs of breath into the frigid air. I had no choice. My two older brother's bedroom was on the other side of the house and I had no way to get to their windows. So I crawled over to my younger brother's window and rapped loud enough to awaken one of them. I prayed it would be my 12 year old brother Rocky and not my seven year old brother Kevin. I imagine Rocky and Car Ke sorry. I imagine Rocky and Kevin staring at a silhouette outside their window and running into my parents' room, wailing about a boogeyman. As I inhaled another cold, teeth-chattering breath, I rapped again. It's me, I said, Susan. Rocky jumped out of bed, backed away from the window and rubbed tired eyes. I waved and whispered again, it's me, your sister. Rocky placed a hand on his chest, opened the window and stepped back as I climbed through it. What are you doing, he asked. I hugged him, I'm sorry, my window is stuck. Even then, so young in life, he was beautiful with his dark tousled hair, deep dimples and eyes the color of caramel. I slipped my pinky into his and said, it's our secret, right? He nodded, I won't tell. On that night, we became each other's secret keepers. He kept mine and I kept his. Six years later, on an August Saturday afternoon, Rocky blew through my parents' front door. His skin was tan, slick with coconut oil. He was 18, preparing to preparing to begin his freshman year at Linden State College in Vermont. I was 22, still living at home and engaged to my future husband. I commuted to the University of Southern Maine pursuing a Bachelor of Arts degree in English. Nice day at the beach, I asked. Awesome, he said. Hey, come to my room when you have, when you have a chance. I have to show you something. My brother had a perpetual twinkle in his eyes, like he was up to something or would be soon. I hustled up the stairs and knock, knocked on Rocky's door. Sis, he asked. Yeah, it's me. Let me in. He opened the door and said, swear you won't tell mom and dad. I grabbed his pinky. Swear. 
He hiked up the left side of his bathing suit shorts. Pegasus was etched, etched into his bronze skin, wings stretched out wide, legs galloping through the sky. What do you think, he asked. I stared at the beautiful winged creature on his muscled thigh, thinking how fitting he chose Pe Pegasus. While many of us are, can, are comforted by curling inside a bubble of security, where we have stable, steady jobs and stable, steady neighborhoods with stable, steady friends, that bubble was too thin, too small, too confining for Rocky. Whenever I stood in his presence, I always felt a tinge of envy. He made the daredevil badass in me feel small and weak. As I matured, I played my life safer, but as Rocky aged, he nurtured a free, fearless soul and sprinted through his life. Rocky was the wild one, the authentic, real deal risk taker. At nine months old, already tired of the slow pace of a crawl, he took his first step, ready and alert to begin his walk, then his run, and then his flight through his miraculous life. He was the natural athlete, athlete who at two years old waddled around kicking a soccer ball with his baby feet. In high school, as he ran across the field with agility and grace, the ball seemed an extension of his foot. He was the captain of his soccer and basketball teams. Rocky's magnetism drew people to his side with both admiration and fierce jealousy. He was that guy. Girls flocked to him and guys wanted to be him and Rocky didn't want any of it. Tired of trying to live up to everyone's expectations of him. One day he said, I wanna go where nobody knows my name. With a boundless spirit that stretched from one side of the world to the other, the universe was not too vast, frightening or risky. It was his playground. Rocky embodied Pegasus' spirit, the mythical and moral Dwing Stallion, capable of everything. It's beautiful, I said, but you are so dead when mom sees that. She won't, he said, not unless you tell her. Rocky entrusted me with his secret and it would stay with me until he had the courage to show my parents his tattoo a year later. Through his freshman year in college, Rocky let his thick black hair grow below his shoulders. Home on summer break after a shower, hair soaked, he said, hey, I need you to twirl my hair like this. He took a chunk of his hair and he twirled it into a tight tube. Why, I asked. It'll, it'll, it will help me make dreadlocks. Dreadlocks? Are you kidding? Don't dread that beautiful hair. Yes, he said, I want them. Come on, sis, help me. Rocky was a bona fide deadhead and had the marching bears, one of the Grateful Dead's most beloved and iconic symbols inked into the tender skin below his waistband. He and his college friends followed the psychedelic rock band around from city to city, believing in its members' message of peace, love, freedom, and mind expansion. Rocky was a devoted fan and with a head full of, dread, and with a head full of dreadlocks and tie-dye t-shirts, he blended in with the cult-like community in deadhead land. Okay, I said, I'll help you. I sat on my parents' bed and Rocky sat on the carpet between my legs in front of their full-length mirror. He watched as I twirled and twirled and I listened as he talked about college, his classes and his blonde-haired, blue-eyed girlfriend, Kristen. She's beautiful, sis. Oh my God, and she is so sweet. I smiled, so are you in love? Our eyes locked in the mirror. He laughed, I think so. She wants to teach little kids. I can't wait for you to meet her. You're gonna love her. I finished twirling the last chunk of his hair and sadness welled inside of me. I didn't want our little pocket of time to end. I love you, I said. Rocky turned around and wrapped his arms around me and kissed the top of my head. I love you too, sis. Two months later in the fall, I was able to make a soccer game at Linden State and I sat on the sidelines with Kristen. My brother was right. She was beautiful, kind, and smart. She looked, leaned over and said, I'm gonna marry him one day. I felt silent as we both watched him soar across the field with Pegasus wings, peeking below his shorts, his dreadlocks flying behind him. I'm gonna stop there. I, I think it's short of 10, but I think that's where I'll stop. <laughs> I'm getting that's, tired. <laughs> oh no, that, thank you so much. That was, that was wonderful. And I think, um, you know, I was thinking uh, while you, well, two things occurred to me while you're reading. One was how my brother reacted to my first tattoo. Which was <laughs> his exact words were, mom's gonna cry. That's what he said. <laughs> um, but the, uh, the other thing really, you know, as I think Trina just said in the chat, like the, the, the uh, just the, the relationship, uh, you know, that, that you were able to convey in that short period of time, you know, it's very easy um, to imagine grief 
as a lonely, you know, person sitting in the corner of a dark room kind of experience, but it, it's really, it occurs because we have these relationships and because people do have this profound effect on us and, you know, we have these attachments to them. So I think, you know, starting with these sort of like wonderful, very like living memories of your brother is such a good place to start. And, um, and I think I can only imagine, you know, if you went around interviewing people about grief, I'm sure you heard, uh, obviously lots of sad stories, but probably a, a lot of funny ones and a lot of like really sweet ones too. Um, yeah, think, it was, you know, much, no, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, um, you know, it was a very dark time for me and, and, um, and I didn't anticipate, you know, it took me three and a half years and I didn't anticipate the healing journey that I would go on with all of these beautiful people that I had the honor of interviewing and holding them in their sibling stories with me. So, and, and still have lasting friendships from those interviews. So, um, yeah, but thank you. Thank you all so much. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you. And, and I think that, you know, the answer there, as far as I've been able to tell in my life too, is that the, the, the way out of those really dark places in life is connecting to other people. And so I, I think it's wonderful that you did that for yourself, but also it's wonderful you did that for all those people you talked to. So that's great. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. All right. What an evening. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Uh, so um, the information for everyone's books, uh, links to purchase their, their items are in the chat if you want to scroll back through. Uh, as I said, we will hang around for a bit after I stop recording. Uh, if you'd like to socialize, connect, network. Network is such a ugly word but if you'd like to be nice to people and make friends uh go for it um I, just final housekeeping uh again all the information about the show is uh, found in one place at tgicast.com also at tgicast on twitter uh, you can find myself on twitter if you feel the need to uh at ridge craswell you can find the show's creator, Trina Thibodeau, at Trina Tibbs, T-R-E-E-N-A-T-H-I-B-S. And you can find the show's booker, uh, who I refer to as the executive vice president of talent relations, Noli Reed, um, on Twitter, at Noli Reed. Um, once again, as Trina said, and this is the closest we've come to a tagline slogan, putting a button on it. If you know people you think might, you'd like to hear, or you think might have something they should share, or you think... Uh, especially actually as with a couple of readers tonight, if you know someone who has a book coming out and they can't go anywhere, uh, please send them along to Noli uh, or Trina or myself. Um, and the, the phrase that has come out of it, which was coined by Trina, which I'm going to end on is this show runs on friendship. Uh, it is an actual social network where we've met friend of a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend. And from a little nucleus, we have now expanded to people we've never met before all across the earth. It is absolutely wonderful and selfishly um, the best part of my week. So thank you all for coming. If you would like to uh, hang around and uh, chat, please do so. And uh, I am going to stop recording now. All right. Yes. All right.